Hi. Uh, <clears throat> this is uh, in this video on my channel, What's Wrong with the World and How to Fix It. Uh, I'm going to look at various explanations of the origins of class society. And, and kind of these are not just accounts of how class society came about in the first place, but kind of what maintains it. And I'm going to look at explanations which I think are absolutely wrong and explain why they're wrong. Uh, and then in the next video, I'm going to talk about what I think is a more satisfactory explanation. So just in, in case you don't know, the last video was about what is class society and how does it work and so on. Okay, so here are some common explanations which you'll be very well aware of, I'm sure. First of all, that agriculture is an invention of the human species, like say 10,000 years ago, whatever, out of human, humans have been around for like 200,000 years. And that agriculture creates a surplus and allows functional specialization. So, so, so in a sense, class comes out of that. So that just like there's people who, who specialize in making weapons and there's people who specialize in ruling the society, the ruling class that organizes society as a whole. This is a specialization. So there's farmers, <coughs> craft workers, blacksmiths and so on, da, 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 you know, all right. <coughs> Okay, so that's one explanation. The next one is that uh, there's agriculture creates a surplus product. In other words, people are producing more food than they eating themselves. And this surplus, uh, there's a battle, you know, like a competition to acquire this surplus and to become the rulers of society. That's a much more conflict theory explanation rather than a functionalist explanation looking at how class functions to organize the society. Uh, and then another functionalist explanation which relates to, to the first one, I suppose, is that uh, large societies and large populations are created by agriculture and that because of their very size, they, these kind of societies require an extra degree of organization that you don't get in hunting and gathering societies and consequently class comes out of that. because it's functional, it's necessary to control conflict, that the ruling group in society makes sure that all of these other factions don't set up and start killing each other. And that's all, uh, often that's, that's proposed as, as, as relative to hunting and gathering societies or stateless societies where there are a lot of uh, wars between um, villages and, you know, raids and so on, which I've talked about in previous videos. And then the last one related to th this as well, it's also a, a sort of functionalist explanation how class is functional for society as a whole, <clears throat> that the ruling group organizes large scale agricultural products. So particularly with irrigation agriculture that, you know, all of these long channels running the water through the channels and the sort of machinery that, that, <clears throat> that moves the water from one place to another and so on that all of this is created by um, or organized by a ruling group, you know, like that, 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 that those irrigation works that are required for producing food. And in, in a sense then that, that class, the ruling class, the ruling organizing group in society creates a reliable food supply for other people, or for, for society as a whole. <clears throat> Anyway, I want to um, suggest that the, these common explanations, there, that they have some elements of truth in them. In the, one, one is that <clears throat> agriculture is certainly a necessity for class societies. It's a necessary condition, but I'm going to argue it's not sufficient. Uh, and it's true that the ruling class always does control the agricultural surplus. So in a sense, that part of the mechanism that they're talking about is, is, is accurate. Um, and you might also, you know, give give class society this that the functional specialization which class societies have uh, uh, are associated with, let me put it just like that, um, has enabled you know huge and, and wonderful monuments, you know, like from the Parthenon and the pyramids and whatever, you know, the Forbidden City of ancient China and so on, and large scale agricultural projects certainly like you know the the rice terraces of of, of states, rice irrigation states, and luxury goods, you know, ama amazing tapestries and, you know, fabrics and God knows what, 
um, craft work and so on. And, and also not to mention literacy, you know, writing and mathematics are also associated with class societies and, and are, not, are not present in, in, in pre-class pre, pre uh, stateless societies and hunting and gathering societies. However, <clears throat> okay, I'm going to now look at these arguments in a bit more detail. Let's look at the first one that agriculture creates a surplus and allows fu functional specialization. One problem with that argument is that, that it, it, it looks at, 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 at stateless societies, you know, like hunting and gathering in particular, but also the stateless horticultural societies and societies that are so preoccupied with growing enough food or, or, or securing enough food through hunting and gathering that they don't have, an, um, you know, that there's no, no, no extra being produced that anyone could consume. This is really mythological in this way, that what, what, what anthropologists have decided, and there's a famous book by Marshall Salen, Stone Age Economics, which talks about this in, more, in, in detail, is that these stateless societies, actually the average hours of work producing what's biologically necessary in food uh, and so on, water, whatever, uh, they spend about three hours a day in that. If, if you know, like, that's very minimal. So what, what does that mean? Okay, it means that they actually could produce a surplus in the sense that one person, if they worked a nine hour day, right, hunting and gathering or, or, or horticulture, simple, simple horticulture and, and supplemented by hunting, you know, like in the Amazon or whatever, they could have worked in a nine hour day, they could have produced enough food for uh, two other people other than themselves from to feed themselves so there was a, so so in other words in a sense there's a surplus in these societies available it's not not that they couldn't have produced a surplus and, and given it to a ruling class uh, or or to, to specialist workers in, you know you know who who made weapons or who specialized in making hammocks or whatever or they decided they chose not to do that and so what did they use that extra time in doing? Well, well, uh, well, clearly what they used it for is a, a rich ceremonial life. You know, a lot of time spent in, in kind of rituals and, and spiritual life and, 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 you know, storytelling and dramatic ceremonies where people dressed up and spent days and days preparing the, the, uh, the, the artworks to go with that and so on. So, 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 um, Stateless societies do a lot of that and they spend their extra time, their surplus time, as it were, in that. Um, and they produce, uh, and the, or, or another way to put look at it is that they, they produce less material wealth than they actually could produce because they, and they use their extra time in leisure. Um, or sometimes they distribute it in non-economic gifts. What well, well, I mean, the cooler ring described by Marcel Mauss is, is a classic of that in the sense that people was, were selling, were, were, sorry, not selling, were, were moving in, as gifts, these uh, elaborate uh, um, shell, shell um, chains of shells, special shells that they would remove from, from, from one island to another by these dangerous canoe voyages and so on. So, so they're producing non-economic gifts that have huge amount of status and prestige attached to them. Um, and what, what we find is that in these societies, classless societies, there's no accumulation of private property. So they're not making a surplus and turning it into private property. And they're not using uh, material goods as political weapons and political leverage. They're not saying, you know, like I've got all this wealth and so you'll work for me because, you know, you haven't got any wealth at all. That, that kind of doesn't go on. That's not happening. So the other thing that's wrong with this explanation that agriculture creates a surplus and that leads to class is that agriculture has been around for a long time now, like as I said, roughly 10,000 years. And in that period of time, quite a lot of societies adopted agriculture but did not become class-based, state-based societies. I mean, this is a thing that everybody knows in some sense, but but when they talk about how why does class happen, they always go, oh, well, it's agriculture, that creates a surplus and that leads to class. Well, actually, you know what? No. Um, 
I mean, Melanesia is, is the obvious case that, that, pe that people, in, in, especially in Australia, are massively aware of. You know, like, these are societies that didn't have huge civilizations and ruling class and all of that. They were rough, fairly egalitarian in that leadership w was the result of, you know, making influential political negotiations within an egalitarian polity where people could not be forced to do work that they didn't want to do, whether their contribution to, to feasts and so on for, for the prestige of the, the big man, let's say, in the Melanesian situation could not be coerced and had to be encouraged. Um, so, so stateless horticultural societies have been around for ages. So they're in, in, in Africa and certainly South America, um, North America, um, you know, Australia, Melanesia and so on. Well, no, it's not Australia maybe, but anyway, that's debatable. We won't go into that. Um, so this common knowledge is buried almost like a case of amnesia. When people come to talk about the origins of social class, they just forget it. The functional specialization of class societies is always hierarchical and not necessarily efficient in relationship to human needs. So, I mean, I'll talk about that more later on, but the, the idea that the, the, the agricultural surplus was this great boon and then the ruling class organized it by putting people into functional specializations that were causing the whole society benefit. No, the ruling class worked mostly on their own behalf to increase their own security and power in, in, the, in, in, in class societies. The functional specialization that was associated with classless societies, with class societies, class-based, state-based societies, is also almost in every case a defamation of human potential. What it means is that people are narrowed down to one thing and don't get to do anything else in their lives and that narrowing causes them various problems. Um, and so the, the, the example of the, the builders of the Egyptian pyramids who ended up with huge back problems and arthritis problems and, and, and so on, like that, that, that is, a, is an example of, of how, how this specialization, which is supposed to be a great benefit and allow, allow wonderful things to happen, actually is not necessarily a benefit to anyone. And the stateless societies did a much better job of making sure that everyone was doing interesting variety of tasks and, and, and living well. Okay, the second explanation of class, which I want to challenge and, and, and consider is that the idea that this is much more the conflict theory of class that comes out of um, leftist and Marxist ideas. The ones who win the battle to control a surplus become the rulers. And so if we look at someone like Ernest Mandela, Trotsky is the, you know, writer on the economy and so on. We can we we find this this uh, pr proposal. Uh, it's certainly true to some extent that um, that yeah, but but what 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 it leaves out and and what is kind of mysterious about it that that in a sense you need to explain. In addition to this, is what makes this competition likely? I mean, why why are people competing to grab control of the surplus? Um, in, in, in societies that are stateless societies where, where um, they have a communi communitarian and cooperative economic system where, where, where competition between people for wealth is non-existent and do doesn't happen and suddenly agriculture creates a surplus and everyone competes for it. Well, actually, no. And, um, and, and there's no reason to, to expect them to behave like that. It'd be very strange if they did. And then the third, the third thing that, um, well, the second thing that I'd, I'd be saying about this is why, it, what, what, the question is why do ordinary people allow themselves to be corralled into these unequal arrangements of class society when, when, they, when they're running the show? You know, like when, when ordinary people are actually running daily life and, and controlling their own local politics and the, and the politics of their group and collectively and, and fairly democratically, why, why do they allow a, 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 you know, a ruling group to people to battle and a ruling group takes control of the surplus? I mean, why, why is this happening? That's a very important question. And one which I will answer next video. And another one is um, that, that uh, the, the 
class societies are functional for large populations because they control conflict. And this is um, right wing um, pundits like, um, no, I can't remember his name. Pinker, yeah, Pinker. Uh, I, I follow this, you know, like, it's like, uh, oh, you know, um, stateless societies are so violent. Well, most of the examples of violent stateless societies are actually horticultural societies that had some form of agriculture. That's an interesting fact, but let's pass over it and, and look at some, more, uh, some, some probably more important issues. Um, that there are, in fact, systems for mediating conflict in egalitarian stateless society, certainly within any, uh, any residential unit, like a village or, 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 a, or a clan group or, or a, tri a tribal residential group or whatever. There are mechanisms for mediating conflict. Um, and, and, and like, um, if you've anyone's watched the, the, the wonderful film Ten Canoes on Australian Indigenous life before contact. What, what it shows is is a conflict that developed between two um, l local groups, and, and and it ended up with people standing a quite like quite a long way from each other and throwing spears at each other until 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 the person who was the guilty party had been speared in the leg, and then and then that was the end of the the, the punishment, as it were. So it's like. Uh, it's a form of feud, if you like, but it's massively controlled by by a whole set of, of rules and regulations. And even some of the the wars that that took place between horticultural societies are also mediated in the sense that very few people get killed, typically in the, in in these in these wars. Most people don't don't actually die in them. Um, The other thing to think about is when we look at an argument like this, like coming from Pinker or someone, is that what, what Pinker doesn't look at is the huge costs of class society. Yeah, I, I mean, even if we accept his argument that, um, you know, the stateless societies, there was all constant warfare and, and young men were getting killed off in, in wars and this was a terrible thing. Yeah, okay, all right, it was a terrible thing. And yeah, and, and sure, that's true of stateless societies. But whether or not people would actually choose class society to avoid this kind of conflict is, to me, is a very un un unlikely. And why is that? Because one, the huge health consequences of class society, which I'll talk about later on, it's disastrous. People are much more in danger in terms of health. They die like younger. They live much, much worse. They're more unhealthy in every possible way and so on. That's one problem. The second problem is the alienation of class societies that you're, that basically most people like 90, you know, 95% of people in class societies are doing what they're told to do on a daily and constant basis. They're being ordered around by a ruthless military dictatorship. This is, you know, okay, so how much conflict and violence in a stateless society are you prepared to accept in, or, in, order, in order to get the, the peaceful uh, experience of being told what to do in the whole of your life? I, yeah, I just don't get it. And then, and then there's the stigma. I mean, the peasant class in, in every class society are regarded as dirt, you know, like they're regarded as the lowest of the low, as, as barely better than animals and so on. This kind of stigmatizing, it's only the ruling class that are allowed to wear fine fabrics and, and, and extravagant luxurious items and so on. Uh, everything about the way the society is organized provides a message that you, you, you're less than, you know, hard, less than human. You choose that to avoid a bit of the possibility of dying a violent death in, in a tribal war? I don't think so. Stateless societies, yeah, okay. So the second part of this argument is that large agriculture creates large populations and then you need to control these large populations. <laughs> Again, stateless societies never had a problem with excessive population. They always had more, more land than they could possibly use to, con to deal with any conceivable climate event. Silence demonstrates that. And, and, and just thinking about it and, and looking, looking at what the situation in Melanesia, for example, or, or in other, or certainly in, in, in Australia and so on, it's not that they were, they were, we, we've underestimated the number of people in these classless societies, for sure. I totally accept that. But at the same time, in terms of uh, in terms of the amount of uh, space available for, for growing food or for gathering and hunting food and so on 
always vastly more than enough. And why is that? Because they kept population constant. They didn't grow their populations massively. It was class societies that created, created large, dense populations. Why? Because the ruling class wanted more peasants to extract more surplus, and, and, and they wanted their armies to go into other, uh, other neighbouring areas and conquer more, yet more land, you know, and more peasants and so on to, to produce more surplus product and so on and so forth. So that's one thing. And the other thing is from the peasant point of view, you know, you're barely scraping a living and you look forward to your children being able to support you in your old age. So you're a lot, you've got to have lots of children. There's no community support as there is in classless societies. So population is actually an effect of classes, population density, population problems. They don't cause class society to happen. They're an effect of it. The next explanation is that class is efficient because it allows the organization of large-scale agricultural projects. Well, let me say this first, that these such large-scale agricultural projects, huge irrigation works and so on and so forth, are much more necessary to the ruling class than they are to the ordinary people. I mean, in stateless horticultural societies and in hunting and gathering societies, people are not, not going hungry. They don't need large-scale agricultural projects to live well. What a load of rubbish. But from the point of view of a ruling class, trying to control a small area of land, that you know, the area, the area within which you can actually send soldiers or, or, or troops on horseback out to, to control the population, you want that, that, that to produce as much surplus as possible so that you can pay as many soldiers as possible and, and, the, and use that surplus to, to control the peasant class that you've, you've got under your control, but also to fend off attacks from other states. Irrigation works. The other thing about irrigation works is that these actually preceded the development of class societies. If we look at places like ancient Egypt before the, before the rise of the huge imperial states and class-based society, or the Andes where, where the Incas uh, took control and so on, and, and look at the early history of these societies before they became class societies, they were already engaged in irrigation. You know? It wasn't that class society made irrigation possible. It was already happening. The third point that I wanted to make about this is that the organisation of large-scale agricultural projects is very often democratic. The example of the Subak system, which is a system of irrigation in Bali, is a really good example in the sense that every village was organised into what's called a banjar, a community organisation which organises the irrigation works and, and, and how, who's getting what water when and all that. This was done completely democratically. And at the same time, a ruling class of feudal elite was extracting the surplus product of rice from these very same peasants. So in other words, irrigation was not being organized top down from some elite and sending the armed troops in to, to organize everyone at all. That's completely wrong. The organization of the irrigation works was done by the community and then the ruling class siphons off the product of that, of that community organization. There's this myth around that, that class societies and civilizations and stuff were, were, were amazingly productive. They're productive in the sense that they produce a lot of showy wealth that's owned by the elite. But they're not necessarily productive in terms of human needs and, and what, what most of the population could do with, you know, like three meals a day, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and, and a comfortable life and f a lot of leisure and, and time for, 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 for dance and singing. You know, like, it, no. Um, and uh, well, I'll, I'll make three, three, three more detail points. The first is that what this kind of thing ignores is the, is the amazing agricultural productivity of stateless societies. You know, like, I mean, one example is the fish traps. You know, like the Ab Aboriginal uh, Australia has, has recently uh, taken notice, 
I wouldn't say discovered, that's a bit much, but it certainly ha has become more aware, let me say that, uh, of, of extensive fish trap works in various parts of Australia, which have been con constructed by the Aboriginal people. And also since Dark Emu, um, the book, um, they're, 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 we're more uh, uh, white Australians that say are more, are more aware of, of huge um, agricultural works growing yam daisies as food and, and so on. It's like class societies, even those which we've considered as hunting and gathering societies, actually do a lot of really amazing agricultural work and, and, and have huge agricultural productivity. I mean, another example, uh, sort of ceremonies and festivals that took place in Aboriginal Australia to celebrate particular uh, patches of abundance where people would come from, you know, hundreds of kilometres away to, to, to celebrate like the bogong moth harvest is one example in northern New South Wales and Queensland, uh, the bunya nut harvest. And, and, all, and, and these, the, these are harvests of, of particular species, you know, um, bogong moths, obviously a moth that you can eat. And bunya nuts are, are like a Norfolk pine. They're, a, they're kind of huge pineapple shaped nut. And, these these supplies were abundant, and 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 also because these um, societies control population, there was more than enough to go around. So so yeah, okay, I'll just say that. Also, the diversity of diet. You know, like the Kung, uh, the Bushmen of the Kalahari were eating eighty five different kinds of food, and like the Irish all died of a potato famine because all they were eating was potatoes. You know, the population in Ireland plummeted from eight million to four million. Over, over you know a sixty year period, I mean, it's just like inconceivable. The reality is that state societies are much less health health less healthy for the majority of the population than stateless societies. They they the stateless societies the most ordinary people suffer from poor health, which is shown by things like you know like the fact that there's that the children are short that a fifth of the children die between the ages of one and five that people have uh diseases such as rickets malnutrition diseases um that adults you know like so greece and turkey for example hunting and gathering societies uh, the archaeology shows the average size of men was five foot ten guess what it was with agriculture five foot three right women were five foot six and then and then with agriculture five foot one why is that it's because these societies class societies screw the population to the absolute limit um, to extract the maximum surplus and because agriculture you know a monoculture agriculture doesn't isn't actually particularly nutritious and people are not getting enough protein calcium and god knows what iron and, and any of this stuff in their diet And then there's famines, right? So, for example, um, let me say in China, for example, between 2019 BC and AD 1911, um, there were 1,828 famines. In, in other words, there was a famine once every two, a major famine once every two, one or two years. In Egypt, the famines were once every seven years. In Rome, there were 35 major famines. Uh, so there was one every 28 years. In England, between 500 and 1500, there were 95 major famines, one in every 10 years. Now, let me just look now at Laslett, a, a, a historian of, of, of England and Europe and so on, he looks at France in the 17th century and the parish records that show births, deaths and marriages and all that. And he says in the 17th century, these famines came at regular, well, irregular intervals. But anyway, in the villages that he's looking at in an area called the Beauvaisis, there was 1625, 1648 and 1693. In other words, not that far apart, really. You know, like you'd, you'd, you'd go through what, at least one famine, or maybe two in your lifetime. All right. So what happened in these famines? There was a sudden rise in burials registered in the parish registers, double or even three times the normal amount. And, and the poor ended up eating grass and, and offal, you know, like the in, internal organs that were left on the, on the waste heaps. Um, 
And it was not until the 1940s that the, the poor people, the ordinary working class people in, in, in Britain were as tall as the upper class. Um, basically, and, and fam famines would kill up, up to a third of the population. So the whole idea that agriculture is a massively productive, that people would move from classless stateless societies to agricultural class-based societies because of the need to secure food supply can't be more mistaken. It's just completely nuts. Now, let's also notice something which is, 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 is obviously true, which is that the ruling class always did better, right? They could, they could secure their, their, their food in, in, in the worst possible conditions, well, almost always. Uh, so, all right, look at Mycenae, a you know, famous pre-Greek civilization, 1500 BC. The royal elite were two to three inches taller and had much better teeth than the ordinary people. I mean, that's just one example. And as I say, working class Britain is another example. So like, why would you adopt class-based society? So people did not create the state and class to organize an abundant supply of food. That is a complete myth. All right, the last point I want to look at now, I'll finish this in a minute, is that functional specialization in class societies enables civilization. So let's forget about the porridge in the morning and all that sort of stuff and the, and the beef at night. No, let's just talk about, you know, the grand operas and everything. Okay, so what, what I'd be saying about that is that, that this kind of myth, and again, this is really common. You know, if you almost, if you watch a documentary on uh, an archeological documentary, you, it'll be surprising if someone doesn't wax lyrical about the great pyramids or the, the huge stones and the massive engineering works and the, and the beautiful lead light or, or something of that type, you know, like you'll get it every, every time. And it's like, what it ignores is the rich artistic and creative life of stateless societies. So, so again, looking at you know my own neck of the woods, if you like, uh, Aboriginal Australia, Indigenous people in Australia before white colonisation had an elaborate ceremonial life. There were huge long poems that were memorised uh, about mythological events. Um, the, the, these, the, these poems are part of song cycles that were performed at ceremonies that would last for days or weeks. Um, in, in, these, in these ceremonies, um, pe people would, would draw, draw on the ground, you know, like cutting into the, into the earth, you know, huge designs taking up a whole paddock or whatever. Um, and, then, and then there was a, huge, a vast set of ritual steps that you would perform to do, to do this ceremony, which might be um, a part of the se a seasonal ceremony for increase for a particular species, or, or it might be a, a record of, of some social event or whatever. Um, there was a massively complex um, kinship system, which, which has taken anthropologists, you know, decades to unpick in detail. It's like, yeah, and, 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 dur and during these ceremonies, people would dress up in, in, in elaborate costumes with, with little white um, fluff feathers stuck in a, a lines, you know, with, with tattooing and um, huge headdresses like, like as tall as, a, as the person wearing them um, in different colors, you know, red and white reaching up. So, so it, it, it's, it, if, we're lo if we're looking at participatory cultural life and civilization in that, in that sense of, you know, art, song, dance, whatever, it's massively manifest in stateless societies. You know, class-based societies didn't create it. And, and, and not only that, but of course, um, in class-based societies, these, these, the, these, this civilization, well, first of all, it was propaganda and promotional for the rich, you know, like the pyramids are a, a good example, but so, so it's not, it's like, in a way, it's not, it's to terrify the ordinary person as much as to inspire them. That's one thing you can say about it. The second thing you can say about it is often it's for the rich and not for the ordinary people. So if we're looking at, you know, the, the wonderful classical mu music of Europe, it was performed for audiences of rich people. 
that's not to say there weren't there were there, there, there wasn't folk music and stuff in class based societies, but all I'm saying is if we're if we're looking at class that you know in quotes civilization with capital with capital letters, it, it wasn't necessarily participated in by ordinary people. <laughs> and I, I suppose I suppose I, I you know a, a little kind of aside would be. Um, you know, if you watch one of these documentaries, if if it if it isn't carved in stone or written down, it doesn't exist. You know, like in other words, there's a massive amnesia again. You know, about what classless societies were like and how rich, culturally rich they were. Um, so all I'm going to say to final finalize this talk is that people did not abandon stateless, classless, community controlled life to create grand monuments and civilization, uh, civilized artworks. It's just not that likely. Okay, uh, next next time, so you're absolutely wondering now as to what I think, why I think class came about and why it's been so persistent. So I hope to be able to uh, enlighten you on that topic in my next talk. Thank you very much for listening. See you later.